My name is uh, Sam Black. I live and work in Vancouver and uh, I'm going to tell you a bit about how I got lost in August of 2004. I had gone uh, north to Whistler three weeks prior to this hike and I had seen this this fantastic ridge leading out towards uh, uh, Powder Mountain. I just come back from the Rockies so I was feeling reasonably fit and optimistic and I thought nice way to end the summer. <sighs> Boy, <laughs> what a way to end the summer. <laughs> The day that I set out was just a glorious late summer day, sunny and just beautiful. I left a, uh, an, a trip plan with a friend of mine. I was also going to be returning on Saturday evening for a supper party at his place. So I said, you know, if I'm not there, well, you should figure that something must have happened. But you know, you have to understand, I wasn't carrying map or compass, I was just sight navigating. Uh, thinking that mm -hmm. the visibility would remain clear and mm -hmm. it'd be just easy, easy in, easy out. Uh, it didn't work out that way. When I woke up the next morning, uh, the whole area was socked in. It was uh, raining quite heavily. I packed up and tried to find that little thin strip of rock that I had navigated my way in on, but my pack was wet and the rock was wet, so the pack was heavy. Uh, I guess my joints were a bit cold and I just didn't feel secure about being able to, to hang on with my hands. Uh, and once I realized that I couldn't get back along that ledge, I stopped eating. So I set aside, uh, I believe I had a bagel and a power bar because I figured, well, if you do find your way out, you're gonna have to hike down to get out to your car. So you're gonna, you know, you'd have to have some food for that. So I set up uh, my tent in a little outcropping of rock and there were rocks on top of me. And that evening, it, it was actually raining very, very hard and I could hear all the rocks uh, coming down with these thuds all around me. And I think at that point, I snapped uh, some pictures of myself because I thought, well, this is it. You know, there's, you're probably not going to die, but if, but if you are going to die, <laughs> you might as well have some pictures for your, your family. Generally, the weather patterns were that it would be socked in in the mornings. It would lift to around, uh, the clouds would lift so you'd have 50 meters of visibility at some point in the afternoon, and then it would sock in again. So after spending the, the day trying to find a, a way to backtrack, I set up the tent again in, in that same spot and passed another night there. On Sunday, uh, August 20th, I was at home approximately one o'clock in the afternoon when I received a request for assistance from our local RCMP detachment. When was he last seen? We had six members come in and uh, we dispatched a crew of four to assist in the helicopter search, uh, which we undertook about four o'clock in the afternoon. At approximately 7 p.m., uh, the, the helicopter was grounded due to poor weather, and the teams at that time uh, opted to go back, regroup. Um, the investigation would continue into the evening, uh, and the teams would go home and rest for an early start uh, the following day. When I woke up Monday morning, I, I thought, uh, well, by now, uh, most likely the search and rescue people will have been notified, so I, I have to move my tent uh, somewhere visible. So instead of backtracking, I went uh, forward, uh, actually the wrong way, and installed myself on uh, what I thought might have been the, the backside of, of Brandywine Mountain. I saw a helicopter uh, enter that valley so I got out of my tent and of course all my clothes were soaked at this point so I, would, I was standing out naked in the rain waving my sleeping bag frantically and I, I wanted to indicate uh, that I was physically okay, there was no problem. Uh, 
And so I gave them the thumbs up and then the helicopter turned around. So I thought, okay, good. They know where I am. They're not gonna fly me out. I understand that, that makes perfect sense to me. If they started flying out every hiker who got lost, you know, where would it end? So I was actually thinking, great, you know, I'm, I'll get out of this okay. At the morning briefing on day two, uh, we, look, we looked at the weather forecast and it was uh, continuing deterioration of a maritime weather pattern uh, for the next few days, uh, which were going to dramatically inhibit any type of search. Uh, we were finding that we were just getting to the brink of where we wanted to be each day when we would get weathered out. I've been in my tent for three days. Uh, it's been raining and socked in, it's running low on food. Have is a bit wet. I really hope that the weather clears so that I can uh, locate the path back to Brandywine Mountain. I tried to get back on my left, that was the ridge, I knew that was impassable. I tried to go behind me, that was up Brandywine Mountain, that was impassable. I couldn't move to my right because there was a snow field, so I hunkered down again and I would see a helicopter. Initially I would get out of my tent naked, stand in the rain and signal, but they would be way, way up on the cloud cover. After a while, instead of getting out of uh, the, the tent in my sleeping bag, I'd rigged up a flag. So every time helicopters would go by, I would just wave the, the flag to indicate that I was still okay, no problem. So I had no inkling at the time that there was this massive search going on because I was thinking that the search and rescue knew exactly where I was. We received a uh, witness report from a local area Whistler resident confirming in fact that she had actually spoken with Sam Black and um, she advised to us uh, that he had mentioned actually going further than the Brandywine area and on to perhaps even Powder Mountain. So with that news, our search area had uh, increased uh, approximately threefold, which was not good news given that we were still hampered by weather. Given the search protocol in the province of British Columbia, we would automatically be ramping up the response. We brought in additional resources both to assist in the management of the search but also to bring in ground crews that would be able to cover off substantially more area. The province at the same time as we were doing our search had two other major searches going and while the search and rescue network is uh, significantly large. Uh, one of the challenges was making sure that each of the uh, search areas was receiving appropriate uh, resources. Wednesday night the temperature really dropped and I thought well um, that, that it must be getting clear outside because there, there's no you know the cloud cover must have evaporated so I got out of the tent and sure enough it was clear you could see the stars so I thought that's it this is you finally are going to get a break in the weather so you better get up at sunrise and then you, you're going to have to go for it. At the review at the end of day four um, a number of events uh, unfolded. One was that we would be receiving help from uh, 120 search volunteers that would be showing up early the following day. I got up at, at daybreak before the sun came up. Brought all my clothes out to dry them to try to lighten the, the pack. Uh, ate my, uh, my power bar and my bagel. So I thought, well, I'm gonna have to get down onto that glacier because there's just no other way to go. So I climbed down the rocks, hoisted myself up on the glacier, and I could see that there was this enormous crevasse. So I thought, okay, you, you're gonna have to go along the lip of the bowl leftwards, and you can't let yourself start sliding because you know you'll end up in that crevasse but the rain had frozen overnight so it was like a bobsled run and as soon as I stood up on the glacier lip I was just flying I mean I was just hurtling towards the crevasse and I just remember thinking you've got to try to keep your legs in front of you so when I went over the crevasse I was pushed 
off on my right leg and landed on my left leg. And as I went over it, I could just look down 25 feet or whatever it was. And I thought, oh God, that's, you would have never, ever come out of there. At that point, you know, I, I was totally shaken up. I, I mean, I, I honestly don't know how I've managed to get from one side to the other. On the morning of day five, I awoke very early to find clear skies. I wanted to get one last look at these uh, high probability areas with the hope that we could not uh, endanger or unnecessarily put people at risk in this search. Having spent uh, two and a half hours in the air, I was advised by our pilot that we were getting low on fuel and would have to be returning. And as we passed by Brandywine Peak, um, Braden Douglas, our spotter in the back seat, uh, looked out the corner of the window and, and over the headphones I heard him say, oh, hang on there guys, I think I might have seen something back there. The pilot turned the machine around and we came in and what appeared to be a large rock uh, on the surface of the snow was in fact uh, Sam Black. And it was evident that Sam had taken a real ride and it, we were just astounded that in fact he was on his feet still. It was like our worst nightmare had come and gone in an instant. After I, I was on the other side, this helicopter came into the, the valley and I thought, wow, it's the search, it must be the search and rescue guys. And so they're trying to turn around and they're signaling me and meanwhile I'm thinking, okay, you guys really want me to walk out, I'll, uh, I'll walk out. And so I started moving and then they started going berserk because uh, they must have thought this guy's totally out of his mind. He's gonna land in a crevasse, which was probably exactly what, would have, what I was going to do. Because he was looking up at us and walking, yeah. right? I was like, oh. So they came down low enough so that one of their members could hop out and make sure that I didn't get myself into any more trouble. I mean, just to see the helicopter and to see people was just, it was just an incredible feeling. I remember going out for lunch with the search and rescue crew at this fantastic brew pub that has the most amazing chicken soup. I mean, I've always liked chicken soup, but this was just delicious chicken soup. And I guess that was kind of the end of uh, that little, uh, um, how should I put it, ill-advised adventure. Yeah, in terms of um, how I was feeling and how I kept myself going, physically I, I felt okay. Mentally I was really shaken up. You come sort of face to face with the thought that you probably shouldn't be alive right now. And that's kind of when I, I went to pieces when I spoke to my, my mother and uh, father. I knew that they were going to be uh, intensely worried, especially once I found out that actually I hadn't been seen on Monday, but I'd been missing for six days. That was easily the, the worst thing uh, about the ordeal. Being involved as a volunteer search and rescue has tremendous rewards uh, for, for people that engage in it. Uh, there is, there is no benefit like being successful in an incident such as this with Sam. There are people out there that will at times need your services and we've been called out to a number of incidences that would have turned out decidedly different had there not been the volunteer capacity of like-minded people in their communities assisting them in times of need. I still find it hard to convey the uh, the depth of my gratitude uh, towards uh, the, the SAR volunteers. I mean, they're such skilled and selfless people. Uh, there's no question in my mind that they saved my life. There's, I was uh, a goner without a doubt. Well, thank you so much, Brad. I really do appreciate it.